Okay, good evening. Welcome everyone. This is Not In Our Town's Conversation, um, continuing on race, white supremacy, and all that good stuff that we're doing right now. So to begin with, um, Not In Our Town, we always like to acknowledge our land that we're on, which is stolen. The land on which we are living is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lene Lenape people past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in their homeland and in the diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs the wealth of this nation was created. Not in our town's mission statement. Not in our town, Princeton is a multiracial, multi faith group of individual, individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to promote the equitable treatment of all and to uncover and confront, the, confront white supremacy, the systems that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding hierarchies based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economical, economic, and cultural systems which have enabled white supremacy to flourish and to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it in all, and eliminate it in all its forms through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, today, our topic is the enduring legacy of Emmett Till. Um, Benjamin Salisbury and Joyce Trotman Jordan are going to tag team on this. Uh, first of all, it's my honor to introduce Benjamin Salisbury. He's from the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. Uh, we met Benjamin when we visited the summer during our uh, the center during our trip south on our journey to better understand the complexity of American history. Um, Benjamin was very generous with his time. Uh, he shared with us his perspectives on racism uh, in the South, America in general, the current situation going on there. And one of the most important things um, that, that got cemented was the interconnectedness of the North and the South as it relates to slavery and its uh, legacy of institutional racism even today, right? So we in the North typically uh, absolve ourselves of slavery, but how in, how how much in the North, the North benefited from it. Um, and, and he had such a great perspective. He also shared his hopes and work for a community to come together towards truth and reconciliation and transformation. So I highly recommend a visit to the South and use that opportunity to visit that Emmett Till Center and engage with the people there. Um, Joyce Trotman Jordan needs no introduction. She's a board member of Not Not Town Princeton and a board member of Mill Hill Child and Family Development Center in Trenton. She's a retired educator, counselor in our school system, and an elder in the community. Personally, she has been instrumental in educating me on racism and white supremacy. She's my mentor and my guide in anti-racism work. So thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Benjamin could not be with us here today as he starts his maternity leave, uh, somewhat unexpected, but for a good reason, I guess he's not here. So he sent us a pre-recorded video and that's what we'll be viewing today and going through the slides. Uh, many thanks to Kim and Linda for uh, organizing all the logistics of this because uh, uh, last minute changes happen and how we come together matters. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sindhu. So I'd like to say welcome to our conversation on the life lessons and legacy 
of Miss Mamie Teal Mosley. There wouldn't be an Emmett Teal without Miss Mamie. So keep that in mind. But before we begin, I have a poem written by Brother Langston Hughes I'd like to share. And also remember, this poem was written during the 1930s. I'm reading the last portion of this poem. Kids who die. Kids who die. Maybe now there will be no monument for you except in our Wow. Rashim Carter, or in a prison grave, Sandra Bland, or Potter's Field, Khalif Browder, or the rivers where you're drowned like Lepnek. But the day will come, you are sure yourselves that it is coming when the marching feet of the masses Will raise from will raise for you a living monument of love, joy, and laughter, and black hands and white hands clasped as one, and a song that reaches the sky, the sun, the song that sung of the life triumphant through the kids who die. Hashtag Black Lives matter. All right, take it away, son. You got this. Benjamin Salisbury. Okay, um, everything should work, uh, but please let us know if you're not hearing sound when I start it in just a moment. Emmett Teal. And we know that Emmett was. No, oh, there we go. Thank you, Mama Joyce. And so the question raised is who is Emmett Teal? And we know that Emmett was born on July 25th, 1941, in Chicago, Illinois. We know that he you know, was murdered on August 28th, 1955. But again, the question is who is or was Emmett Teal? Well, um, from what we've been able to uh, gather from the words of his Thank you, Mama Joyce. And so the question raised is, who is Emmett Teal? And we know that Emmett was born on July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois. We know that and he you know, was murdered on August 28th, 1955. But again, the question is, who is or was Emmett Teal? Well, um, from what we've been able to uh, gather from the words of his mother and Wheeler Parker uh, and others, uh, Emmett Teal was a loved child, right? Uh, and, and, and a fun-loving uh, young man and, and teenager. In a lot of ways, you know, like almost any other teen who had hopes and dreams and wishes of possibly becoming an officer one day or even a preacher, perhaps. Um, and then those words are captured uh, in Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley's book, uh, Death of Innocence. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we know that Emmett uh, was, was, you know, was a, a, a person. He was a human being. He was a teenager. He was a child, quite similar to... Uh, you know, to our own children, right? To our own uh, brothers and, and nephews and cousins and good friends and classmates. Um, you know, he was a person. And so when we think about the life of Emmett Till and, and his unfortunate murder, I, you know, I think it, it bears to mind that, that in the summer of 55, uh, there was a considerable amount of things going on, especially in Mississippi. Uh, so in August, we know that Emmett, along with his cousin Wheeler Parker, or, or really more specifically, uh, by way of an invitation given to Wheeler Parker uh, uh, to spend the remainder of his summer uh, in Delta, Mississippi, 
uh, Emmett is given an invitation or an, an, an invitation is extended to Emmett uh, to accompany Wheeler. Now, I want to be clear that Mrs. Mamie Till, um, Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley was well acclimated uh, to to the, the social codes and the customs and practices of Mississippi. And, and as such, you know, she was very reluctant to allow her son to come to Mississippi. This would be his first and final, I mean, this would be his third uh, visit to Mississippi, but the first one uh, unaccompanied uh, or, you know, by his mother or with his mother. And so I think as with any caregiver, she was greatly concerned and we know everything else to have transpired would. Uh, but speaking very specifically uh, about the Emmett's visit and, and, and more specifically in, in Money, Mississippi, uh, at approximately 7.30 p.m., it is Emmett Till along with Wheeler Parker and Simeon Wright, uh, I think Maurice Wright, and another local uh, from the area, a town of money, uh, they come to Brian's Grocery and Meat Market, which was just a, a local store in that, you know, in that vicinity. Uh, contrary, I'm sorry, uh, well, no, I'm not sorry, contrary to the misinformation that's been spread when we think about uh, what took place in Money, Mississippi, the account given to us by Wheeler Parker and Simeon right up to his passing, uh, paraphrasing, of course, is that uh, Emmett was not dared or goaded into going into the store in Money, Mississippi. Okay, there was never, you know, Emmett didn't pull out a picture of an image of a young lady that happened to be white, and he didn't say he, you know, had a white girlfriend back home. Um, and no one, none of the locals said, well, you should try to get a date with the local shopkeep. No, Emmett just went into the store to get candy and bubble gum because, well, he wanted some candy and bubble gum. Uh, and again, these are the words uh, shared with us by Wheeler Parker and Simeon right up to his passing. So this happens on August 24th. We do know that again, also by the account given to us by Wheeler Parker and Simeon Wright, uh, that Emmett whistles at Mrs. Carolyn Bryant outside of the store. Um, and so this was August 24th. A few days later, uh, at approximately 2.30 in the morning at August 28th, uh, the home of Mr. Mose Wright is invaded and Emmett is taken out of the bed. He's sleeping, uh, never to be seen alive again. The body of Emmett Till is then recovered on August 31st in um, the Tallahatchie River. And so we know that, uh, you know, that as such, you know, it was the murder and the trial and, and the decisions that Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley uh, that would give way basically to uh, be the spark or, or as I or oftentimes we put place it that the preamble to the civil rights movement uh, would be the things that occurred uh, during, you know, the late August and, and proceeding uh, in money. And so that's, um, you know, that's a little bit more about uh, in its tragic death. And so the, the next images are going to be graphic uh, and to be very spe specific, uh, these images are that of Emmett laying in wake. Um, and so I you know, want to give y'all an, an opportunity uh, to prepare yourselves for that and or if need be, you know, to, uh, you know, probably, you know, not watch the next few slides. And so we know again uh, that, that he was tortured and murdered on August 28th, 1955. And we know that the body of Emmett Till makes uh, it's his arrival back into Chicago. I want to say September, if memory serves me correctly, September the 2nd. So the body of Emmett Till is recovered on the 31st where a hastened burial uh, is, is demanded. And uh, and this burial takes place at East Money Church of God in Christ, which is the, the church for which um, 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 Mr. Mose Wright uh, was a retired preacher. When Mrs. Mamie Till is made aware that this burial is taking place, she demands that it's halted and, and then makes demands that the body be brought back to her in Chicago and, and her demands were met. Um, and so she performs a personal autopsy on the body of her son, right, on the remains of her child. Um, and then she makes the decision uh, to, to, you know, to, to give, make the world give an account of some sort uh, to this hatred, right, and to this heinous act that happened. And so, you know, in the, you know, we see this quote where she says, you know, you know, she wants the world to see what they did to, to her baby. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I think this was a, you know, this was a pivotal uh, moment in, in not just civil rights history, but just American history, period, where quite possibly for the first time ever, um, America uh, has to bear witness to, uh, you know, the, the, the blatant act of, of racism, but also what apathy towards racism can generate and, and when what hatred unchecked uh, generates. And, and we see this expressed on the body of this 14 year old child.
And so in this next image, we're seeing, uh, you know, Mrs. Mamie Till, well, a continued image of her in public mourning, uh, you know, for the loss of her son and, and quite possibly knowing this would be uh, the last time she would view uh, the remains of her son, at least like in real time. Uh, this funeral begins, uh, I want to say September 3rd at Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ, which is you know, it's in Chicago. And estimates on the low end of around 100,000 people view the body of Emmett Till, uh, but then on the high end of a quarter of a million people. We also know that that publications like the Chicago Defender and Jet Magazine uh, also captured images of Emmett and, and shared that with the public. So you had the, you know, the 100,000 to 250,000 people that viewed, but then you had the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other people, black and otherwise, uh, that, that that became a little bit more aware of one, uh, the story uh, of Emmett and the agony of his mother, but then two, about the plight of racism and, and, and its most uh, vicious uh, exhibitions being done so uh, or being continued in the South. And so this story and, and this and this tragedy, uh, con you know, shows itself in a lot of ways, even on the face of Mrs. Mamie Teal. And we know that uh, that that you know that Emmett is buried at Burr Oak Cemetery, but we know that this isn't. Where I guess this you. I guess right. you didn't know we're me. Really, really I don't really know Do you remember that, me? That as a result of, of these things, <laughs> Mrs. Mamie Till uh, makes it a mission <laughs> to go out into a lot of you know all over the country, more specifically all over the southeast and in other places, uh, to share what has been happening, uh, what has happened to her son, but also to to others. Right. That we know that, um, you know, as unfortunate and tragic as it is that this child uh, was murdered uh, for for, you know, for doing for nothing more than, than flirting or whistling uh, at a at a at an adult white woman in Mississippi. You know, Emmett was not the first. And unfortunately, you know, by no means was he the last. Uh, but nonetheless, she made it a point and others uh, to, to share with as many people as possible. One, uh, again, the, the tragic realities when we think about racism, but then two. The importance of people becoming informed, engaged, uh, and involved with trying to uh, 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 make things better and different in this country and the various neighborhoods that make up America. And so this brings us to the question, what are lynchings, right? And, and you can see the slide, but basically uh, lynchings are a very specific type of, of murder. Um, uh, lynchings are message killings, right? Uh, you know, they have its roots and foundations in white supremacy. Uh, and so when we think about, uh, when we think about enslavement and everything, you know, proceeding, well, quite often, um, um, when a person would get out of line, when we think about, uh, when we think about the social codes and the ways for which black folk had to interact with white folk, if at all, well, if or when a black person or, or people of color uh, um, got out of line, so to speak, and, um, an example would be made out of that person. And so depending on the severity of that infraction, that would give way to the response. And, and, and if an infraction was ever so large or ever so severe, well, then this person would be punishable by death. And not just a quick murder, right? But no, a, a public, uh, humiliating, uh, dehumanizing uh, means and exhibitions of, of, of one, killing this person for getting out of line, but then two, telling and informing others very matter-of-factly that if you go down the path of, that this person has, then you and or your family and other loved ones uh, could receive a very similar fate, right? So when we think about lynchings, when you hear the word um, lynch mob, right, that speaks to like a group of people that are active participants uh, in the torture and murder of an individual. And sometimes that's synonymous with hangings uh, because quite often, you know, when we think about lynchings, we see uh, people having been hung uh, in a public display of some sort, be it on a tree or something else, uh, but it's not limited to that, right? We know people were burned alive. We know people were tarred. Uh, we know people were mutilated uh, publicly uh, and, and a host of other uh, unbelievably heinous and dastardly uh, um, um, actions when it comes to a uh, lynching and when it comes to, uh, you know, again, that, that white supremacist base uh, that would embolden folks to take such course of action. And just quickly reading the quote of Mr. Derek Johnson, who serves as the NAACP president and CEO. Uh, and when we think about modern day lynchings, for that matter, uh, he states, what we witnessed with George Floyd was the same public spectacle. Someone in broad daylight 
uh, with onlookers around being killed at the hands of a law enforcement officer who has just complete disregard for human life and felt he was above the law, right? And that, again, goes back to some of that historical, some of the historical context, content uh, and, and customs and practices when we think about place and humanity uh, and black folk in these spaces and, and what is and is not acceptable. But then also just very matter of factly uh, putting the onus on those individuals that carry out these things. Um, th that in, in some ways is what speaks to uh, a lynching. The other thing I want to uplift uh, respectfully is the fact that, you know, Emmett Till, uh, again, was one of so many uh, people who had been lynched, right? But we know that lynchings go back as far as enslavement, right? Which is like 1619. Uh, and unfortunately, in a lot of ways, uh, we, we see them still being carried out today in one facet or another. And when I say the numbers are staggering, that is not hyperbole. Uh, based off of the numbers that were, were you know, researched um, uh, from, you know, National Memorial for Peace and Justice, right, that, that was looking at a very specific time point from like 1882 to 1968, uh, we're just, I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of around 4,700 uh, documented recorded lynchings, right? So that's like quite literally less than 100 years time. Uh, you have well over 4,700 people that had been uh, uh, murdered this way. And those are the ones that we know about, right? Those are the ones that we have a record for, right? Those are the ones that are, for lack of a better word, accounted for. Uh, how many more are there? I, I don't, you know, who knows? Um, but also when we think about where these lynchings take place, uh, um, unfortunate, well, there's no fortunate place, of course. Uh, but when we think about the, the correlation between the South uh, and more specifically states that kind of sided with the Confederacy uh, and lynchings, it's an overwhelming, um, um, from a numerical standpoint, overwhelming amount. And unfortunately, you know, my home state uh, happens to be the top of that list, coming very close to uh, just a little bit under 600 uh, recorded lynchings during that time. Uh, um, and again, to, to put that into perspective, uh, we're looking at a number just a little bit over 4,700 with Mississippi having uh, just a little bit shy of five, I mean, a little bit shy of 600. You know, that's almost like, that's close to around 13, maybe 15% of the lynchings that were recorded in this time period happening in Mississippi alone. And we know that there are like about 10 states named on or, or uh, recorded uh, on, on, this, on this document. So that in and of itself is, is very telling and frightening. Uh, but nonetheless, um, um, it's important to be mindful of, of these statistics and mindful of this history because um, although it is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and challenging, it's still a part of the American story, uh, one for which I think it's important for us to acknowledge um, and do so in a place that allows us to begin unpacking and unloading some of these truths. And as I stated earlier, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, there's still, uh, you know, lynchings are still happening today. Um, so case in point, when we think about this particular slide and some of the information uh, that's in it, uh, it talks about a young man who's, you know, who had been missing uh, since October of last year, but his remains showed up or were identified, uh, what was it, um, I want to say uh, March of this year. And, and prior to his missing uh, or to him being reported missing, he basically called his mom and told her that, that, you know, he believed that he was being followed and harassed. And if something were to happen to him, you know, there were certain persons uh, that should be questioned, right? Uh, very similar to a lynching uh, or very similar to, to how we define lynchings, right? Uh, and as such, uh, you know, we know that there are other examples. Uh, I, I know very matter of factly, like back in around, I think 2010, there was a young man found hanging from a tree uh, in Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, and, and I know that in the summer of 2020, I, I, if memory serves me correctly, uh, over 10 people or 10 people rather uh, all across the country were found hanging in trees. And this was the same summer that George Floyd was murdered. Right. And so it just speaks to the fact that, you know, although we have made progress when we think about, um, you know, equality and progress and change, there's still a lot to do. Right. There's still so much to do. And although, you know, we're kind of looking at Mississippi on this slide, it's not just a Mississippi problem. It's not just an issue uh, that, that Mississippi and the South is faced with. But, but when we think about racism and the negative impact that it has, uh, it is far reaching beyond the geographical borders of, of Mississippi and, and South America, I mean, and uh, the Southern states of America alone. And with that, y'all, we know that, you know, we have to continue. 
right? We know that, that even in the face of, 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 of these uh, challenges and in, in, in these environments that are given way to, uh, to people uh, dehumanizing others, uh, you know, we're not without uh, the ability to, to you know, to, uh, to, to make the world a better place, right? That, that even though uh, it almost seems and sometimes feels like we're not making progress, I think we know differently. Um, and I think we have the resolve to, to hold each other accountable and hold uh, um, um, ourselves in, in such a light that it would give way to us to continue, uh, you know, to share history and share the truth with one another and use that information uh, to be better. And so what does that look like? Well, I think it looks like um, many in multiple forms for galvanizing transformation. All right, we know that, at least in this slide, we're talking about like 1964 uh, participants at a Freedom Summer meeting. And, and, and some of the tenets for which we believe transformation takes place is love, community, courage, and hope. Um, you know, we have towering examples of that. Uh, when we think about love, we're not talking about uh, just the, you know, just the, the warm, fuzzy feeling you get uh, when, when, you know, when it comes to uh, being accepted. No, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about that resolve to value one another, right? The resolve to acknowledge the humanity of each person and do the best we can to preserve and protect that, right? Such an act is done in love. I think when we think about Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley, who said very matter-of-factly, uh, when she was, I mean, sorry, when she was asked, uh, what is it that, that kept you going, right? Like, how did you even have the, you know, the unction to share with the world your pain and, and your son, uh, the remains of your child, uh, and, and, and then your pursuit for justice ongoing? Well, then, you know, can, you know paraphrasing, although you can see the, those words yourself, you know, she says, you know, it was because I love him, right? It was because I loved my child, right? And because she loved people, right? She loved her people and others. And I think that love uh, is one that is not uh, exclusive to just Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley. I think, uh, I think a lot of us uh, try to do good and what is right by way of love. And it is through that resolve, right? It is through that commitment to valuing and cherishing others that we, that we find our ways in various means and modes of convening. And, and it's through that continued effort and resolve to learn more that we then, um, again, using the word in the, in the slide, we galvanize uh, ourselves to, to, to give way to transformation. And that's not an easy process. But another thing that, that, that speaks to that is community, right? When we think about the Black experience, uh, e even prior to enslavement, uh, community has always been at the, like at the epicenter of, of, of the strength of Black folk. Um, and, and I dare say, however, that, that even when we think about the, the better qualities of America, uh, it is those shared values amongst community, uh, regardless of race, right? Regardless of culture, um, um, you know, it's through community and through the valuing of, of a collective that we also see a, a galvanization of some sort or, or many modes of galvanizing uh, that have given way to progress and change in this country. Um, and so you also have courage and hope, right? It takes all of those things and a whole lot more, of course, but those things in particular, those four components in particular, love, community, courage and hope, uh, I think that, that helps, that has helped us make the progress that, that we're benefit, that we're beneficent. I mean, that we benefit from, but also some of the progress that we hope to make going forward. Right. And again, like when we think about, uh, some of the movements, uh, that have, that have taken place in this country, when we think about the modern civil rights movement, we think about the black lives matter movement, right. We think about like the young people's movement back in the day and so forth, right. All of that can be viewed uh, from the perspective of love and community, courage and hope, right? You have to have courage to, to, to do this kind of work. You have to have courage to even be willing to acknowledge uh, the challenges that exist amongst people, uh, amongst all of us. And by us, I mean all of those that care about the well-being of people. Uh, it's not an easy thing to wrestle with and grapple with. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, for those that do, even, even with it being a very unsettling uh, reality, uh, it, it takes a lot of courage uh, to choose to come into a place where you're learning and hearing and sharing with others, uh, the you know these hard truths. But there's hope, right? There's there's hope, uh, and that hope is also a part of the component that fuels us to continue learning and, and convening and growing together. And I think some in some ways, when we think about again hope, 
you know, you know, looking at, at the successful election of uh, President Barack Obama and, and his reelection, that being like, one, I think the first official time for which an African American uh, is 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 elected as president, that speaks to progress, right? It speaks to potential as a society, right? It speaks to us being able to acknowledge our history, but then choosing for a number of reasons uh, to come together and work together uh, and work for change, right? And work uh, for peace, right? And work for progress. Uh, these things and so many other examples are, I mean, so many other instances are towering examples of, of the importance and the power that love, community, courage, and hope encompass. But I think another thing to, to give light to is the fact that you also have, um, you know, you have various means and mediums of expression uh, that speak to the necessity of change, right? It speaks to the acknowledgement of the realities that people are facing. And so hip hop, for example, is one of those uh, examples as well, right? When we think about uh, uh, the stories that are told uh, on the, you know, on, on, on in different environments, uh, more specifically, some of those urban environments, like in New York, Chicago, LA, and a lot of other places, uh, uh, you have these stories told uh, by way of different beats and, and rhythmic patterns uh, that, again, speaks to uh, the, 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 the issues that, in particular, Black folk, but also just people of color in general, have faced, and hip-hop being a, a means and a ways of not just expressing an art form, but really also expressing a message, right? A message of, of reality, but then also that message of, of, of fighting back, uh, that message of not conforming to the status quo and not allowing for that uh, to continue to be the norm. And hip hop has had an amazing impact uh, um, on, on alerting the world uh, of the things that people have, have been dealing with, but then also ways that people can, uh, you know, can, can fight against uh, some of those um, uh, ill norms, so to speak. And so very specifically, uh, uh, we definitely want to encourage y'all to check out this, this, this special uh, uh, that was done a while back called Fight the Power. So that's, that's actually, some of y'all probably already know this, right? But, uh, but Fight the Power was actually uh, uh, a song done by Public Enemy uh, that was really kind of speaking against police brutality and other uh, uh, issues that, 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 that very much plagued uh, a lot of, 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 of urban communities and neighborhoods, right? And so they were speaking uh, power to truth, so to speak. Uh, that even though, yeah, you do have this agency or persons within this agency that were operating from a place of power and misusing that power, it's important for 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 people to arm them to fight the power with information, right? To fight the power with peaceful protests, right? To fight the power, so to speak, uh, um, you know, with love, right? With community, right? With galvanizing themselves and being armed with truth, uh, and so a lot of that and and so much more is expressed. Uh, in this documentary uh, um, that, that was shared on PBS a while back. And so in summary, y'all, we, we want you to know that, that we're not at the mercy of history alone, okay? And that we can make history, uh, that we're making history even today, and that the future we want, you know, is it's incumbent on us to, to continue to work together, right? And the truth is there are people that are working together even now to deal with uh, anti-racism and, and change. Case in point, you know, not our, not in our town, uh, Princeton. It's a towering example of that. Uh, uh, our, the community that I'm a part of began a, a racial reconciliation process back in the mid 2000s, and there are a host of a lot of other uh, communities and, and and coalitions and cohorts uh, that are doing work very similar to this. Where uh, again, they're coming together just to learn more, but then they're also trying to use this knowledge as a way uh, to impact local and and hopefully widespread culture change. Uh, in, in, you know, in the various places that we inhabit. Um, and there's just a ton of other ways for which, you know, we can, we can work together and we can, um, and we can learn more about uh, the history that has impacted us, but also the steps we can take uh, when we think about the various ways for which uh, racism sometimes shows itself, right? It's not just in that person-to-person -person interaction, but it's also in some of the systems and, and, and it's in some of the, uh, the, the, the policies and guidelines and, and, and practices uh, that are actually supposed to aid and assist folk, regardless of color and regardless of ethnicity and things of that nature. But it's sometimes, unfortunately, uh, um, 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 used in a way to actually do harm to folks of color. And so, again, it's, it's important for us to continue to arm and, and, and I guess, equip ourselves is a better way of saying that, uh, with truth. Uh, and, and to do that from a place that positions more of us 
to continue to learn and continue to grow and continue uh, um, uh, to, to, to be stewards of light and goodness and then go out into the world and encourage others to do the same. So on that note, I turn you over back into the hands of Mama Joyce. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for taking a few moments to, to, to be with us and to talk with us. Uh, well, actually, to, to hear from us uh, as it relates pertains to this presentation. We hope you got something out of it. Uh, and, and I hope that you are inspired to uh, continue to do good work wherever you may be. Thank you and uh, have a great afternoon or evening. Again, thank you, son. Thank you for sharing your commitment to our struggle and reminding all of us of the importance of studying the true history of our country. People, when we choose not to call out hate, bigotry and racism, we are allowing it to flourish. And finally, this work is hard and must be done out of love love for humanity. In the words of an ancient African principle, Ubuntu, humanity to others. I am what I am because of who we are. And before we go into our breakout rooms, I do believe we have a song from Sweet Honey and the Rock based on the work that Sister Ella Baker did years ago. Take it away, Maria. Yeah, hi. Yeah, okay. so let me if you can click on that video. Yeah, thank you. We all believe in freedom can our rest.
And that's the first time I heard that. <gasps> and she plays it, that song pretty often um, to frame some of her stories. Yeah, she's it's really good. So I do hear it and every time it moves me. Okay, I know that. I get, I get, I get all teary eyed. Yeah. When I sang it in Philadelphia, we sometimes sang the chorus. The, the way the resistance choir sings it is, um, we not will not rest until until it comes. And when when I sang it in Philadelphia, we would sometimes sing, "We will not rest until it is won." Won. To emphasize the fact that it's not going to come unless we work like heck for it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We got a lot to do. Mm, 10 lynchings in 2022. Check that out. Yeah, I'm still blown away by that. And Benjamin, well, we had an opportunity to interact. He's such a wonderful young man. Oh. Yeah. yeah. But but he's not the one who gets the media attention. Nope. Unfortunately. Yeah. There are no stories about um, him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to bring folks together. Well, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, so many uh, people have talked about lynching, and it wasn't the anti lynching U.S. bill was not signed until 2022 by President Biden. How many presidents, Truman, all along, were asked, but they couldn't because they did not want to lose the Southern Democrats. They would go lose the Southern vote, and we've had that shadow with us all of our all of our his history. I mean, the Southern Republicans. Yeah, them the Southern vote that didn't want blacks to to get anything, but certainly exactly. How, right. You're America, you're supposed to be standing for something and you can't sign an anti-lynching bill? Mm -mm. Hard to believe. Right. Mm -hmm. so... Shelly, are you going to- um, I'd be interested to hear if, um, oh. if folks had something to share, something that came up in your group that was particularly resonant for you or that you feel like other folks would benefit from hearing. We'd love to have a few of those sharings if that's something that makes sense for you. You can just have a lot group. of good, good yeah, we did. We had, we had a great group. Go ahead, Ronnie. <laughs> I'm going to need help. I have pages of notes. Um, um, was pointed out the, the hypocrisy of, uh, you know, in Texas where um, schools are not allowed um, to discuss certain topics because it's going to offend the white children. Um, and um, it was pointed out that what about the black children who are not getting to hear the reality of their um, of, of the history and how it it you know they're represented in it, and I um, I think the corollary is there also about what damage are we doing to the white kids for not letting them know that truth. So if there's going to be a change, um, they they need to know about it. It's not it's not about putting the shame on them, it's, it's about um, bringing them uh, to some understanding so that there's a chance for change. But if they don't know about it, how can there be change? Um, I don't know, did I do that justice? It was okay. Yes, you did. But um, <laughs> um, Excellent. There, we, we have a lot of points that we should let other people speak. Um, the, the, the first point was that, um, it seemed to one of our, our team that um, whole topics are suppressed from discussion uh, with the tacit understanding um, that we prioritize white comfort. So um, very important things don't get discussed 
because and it's and it's and it's part of this about you know the ch being sure that the the children in, in Texas are comfortable are not made uncomfortable. But um, as as Carolyn summarized, that silence is not an option if we're talking about how um, we can affect change. But that in fact it is often the choice that's made, even though um, it's really you know stops the 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 op, the the possibility of change. Um, people wondered if there were in fact 10 lynchings in 2022, why didn't we hear about them? Why don't we know about them? And, um, and that speaks to how the, the press um, chooses again to, um, to prioritize white comfort. Um, That's probably enough for me. Uh, I, I loved the closing. Um, someone pointed out that the effect, the, Carolyn asked the question, you know, why did we know about um, Emmett Till and not about so many others? And, um, and it was pointed out it was because his mother made a point of being sure that the public saw him and knew him and as Shirley pointed out, it humanized the, the um, happening. But someone else said that um, she didn't own the shame that lynching implied and um, by making it public that way, forced us, the, the viewers to um, the world to own the shame of lynching, which is maybe what distinguishes that particular case. That's what I've got. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Any other group members with a few resonant thoughts? Well, we don't wanna hog the microphone, but our group also, Ms. Shirley also talked about um, um, you know, communities coming together to, um, you know, galvanize to create change. And she talked about a shared partnership between um, Princeton, um, I forget what she said, the faithful and um, her church when Trayvon was killed, they created concerts and many of the moms from Trenton came and they talked about how their children were killed. So that's one way to build communities is to um, have um, interorganizational um, functions and mm -hmm. um, and and inter um, uh, uh, municipalities um, kinds of things. Thank you. Yes. Someone else pointed out that stand your ground laws are um, actually a way of of institutionalizing mm -hmm. lynching. And and um, in a way, making them permissible. Yeah, um, it's pretty ugly to think about. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Sharon. Sharon. Uh, just in our group, Carlissa talked about, related to um, Mamie Till's courage, is the courage that she and other Black women conjure up every day when they're in, when, you, when you're in public or, or purposely joining certain groups where you're the only or one of the only people of color or African Americans that just, and I, I would say my observation is it's it's all black people that are living well black and unexpectedly find themselves in positions of not being uncomfortable only, but perhaps being in great danger or verbally, verbally attacked, which is, you know, a verbal kind of, I don't want to use that L word, but you know, yeah. So, I mean, that's not what she said. I'm, I'm observing that myself. 
but just the courage that Black people and people of color exhibit it every day or conjure up that I thought was notable. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Like to, if I could follow up on Sharon's, because we were in the same group and, and speaking, the white person's quoting another black person in, in the group, Roz Flood, who talked about a time when it was like she'd had it up to there and she spoke out and felt very liberated afterwards and the, the need to be bold and to take risks and um, and what a what incredible models of courage that provides for all of us. If um, people who have so much more at stake can can take risks, uh, how much more obligated are we to, to do so as well? Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Excellent point. I just want to say thank you to everybody. It was a wonderful program. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Is there one more comment? I know there's always somebody who afterwards thinks, oh, I should have said this thing. So try to fast forward to that moment and say it now. I have a comment. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. <laughs> well, I just, uh, if, if you haven't been to the African-American uh, History Museum in Washington, I highly recommend it. Um, and, and just a warning, um, Emmett Till's casket is there and it's in its own room. And usually people are there weeping people of all races. And it is one of the most moving experiences I had um, in front of that casket. So I, I recommend going because it is, you know, it, it because the, well, the whole museum is wonderful, but that's a particularly spiritual moment uh, to, to in, you know, have that encounter. Uh -huh. And can I say one last thing? I'm, I'm not going to take long. So we're moved by Emmett and we're moved by Trayvon and we're moved by George Floyd. Why aren't we moved by the kids who are killed in Chicago every weekend? Yeah. Yeah. Those are lives too. Or Philly. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Trenton. <laughs> Seven square miles. Very true. So I'd like to close by once again thanking everyone who worked so hard behind the scenes and in community to pull together a program of such power and depth and then to pivot um, in the face of the, the very exciting development of Benjamin's impending parenthood. Um, I just am really grateful to everyone who, who brought this program together. And I want to ask friends to just spend a few moments reflecting on those four words that Benjamin yeah. Salisbury brought back, brought us back to throughout his portion of the program. Think about what this work could be in the face of love, with the strength of community, standing on a foundation of courage, reaching into a future with a feeling of hope. He used the word galvanize. 
And I want us all to encourage ourselves and each other to be galvanized. To push forward. And I'd love to encourage everyone to uh, make a note on your calendar now for next month's program, which has become a kind of tradition for Not In Our Town Princeton, in which we invite the young members of our community to share their wisdom. It is uh, reliably one of our most richly exciting programs of the year. And this year we'll have the additional excitement of for those friends who feel comfortable uh, being in live and in person while we still maintain a commitment to enabling folks who are not able to be physically present to still participate. So that will be Monday, June 5th. Bring a friend, tell a neighbor, have a conversation that you maybe wouldn't have had. And uh, thank you again for your time this evening and uh, at, at all of our past events. And thank you for the continuing partnership of the excellent friends at the Princeton Public Library. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.